Play Nan Extended Play. You know, I fooled around on drums and did various things, but it wasn't until punk rock occurred and it was suddenly, um, <clears throat> and also the circle of friends that I had in Dunedin. Um, you know, I'd been to see a lot of music and bands as a teenager, but suddenly uh, realised that you could not be able to play anything particularly well at all, and you could play. And uh, I heard the Velvet Underground's uh, double live album, and Mo Tucker played a single snare beat all the way through What Goes On. And at the time I thought, <clears throat> that's kind of magical, and that's possible. I could do that, <laughs> so uh, that and, you know, uh, inspired us to start playing. Uh, my brother David, who was 17 at the time, was at art school in Dunedin, and he met Peter Gutteridge, and the enemy had formed. I'd try it out as the drummer for the enemy, but I thought Chris Knox's ego was too massive. I couldn't be in a band with him. He's just too much of a personality overwhelming, you know, um, so I thought, well, I won't do that, and um, David and Peter uh, <clears throat> started playing and writing songs, uh, we bought a guitar, David immediately showed uh, aptitude, you know, playing the guitar, and uh, they basically started getting something together, and I said, well, I can play drums, and that was the beginning of the clean, basically. Yeah, the clean, David, myself, we had a falling out with Peter. Um, we were insane about rehearsing. We were trying to get really good, and we thought Peter was lagging behind in terms of his uh, application to the bass. He was kind of holding us back. We'd sort of, we jumped ahead, uh, you know, the way we're playing and what we're up to. And uh, we said to Peter, look, you know, you've just got to you've got to rehearse, you've got to sort of get yourself together because we want to be really, we want to be good and um, you're not sort of like doing it, you know. And uh, we asked Peter to leave. I think it broke his heart at the time. He also said it was the best thing that ever happened to him because it, it sort of pushed him off in his own direction, which is cool. But, um, you know, he was, he's an incredibly creative person. Uh, we had another drummer called Lindsay Hook who we travelled to Auckland with, we were without bass players. And we spent a lot of time playing with different people, different bass players in Auckland, trying to keep it together. Our best uh, bass player was um, Debbily, who went on to the Birds and East Roys later, and Jamie Jetson, who had been the Idol Idols. So we had two blondes, she played a 12 string Rickenbacker, and we did a few gigs in Auckland, sort of in the 79 period. And we had Jessica Walker from Shoes This High, who went on to them, she played with us as well. And we tried out numerous drummers and bass players in that period, um, including we experimented with Jed Town. He came and played with us and we thought this guy's just off the planet. He was amazing, but he just, we just realised that he had his own path to walk down, you know. We initially got out of Dunedin. We, Jim Wilson was promoting bands in uh, Christchurch. And the clean had actually played in Christchurch in 70, 78 with the enemy. We did a disastrous gig and then we did another reasonable gig but um, we hadn't been back and we'd sort of been in Dunedin, stuck in Dunedin, we'd been to you know Auckland in 79 and uh, we spent 1980 I think working on stuff and then 81. I can't remember if we approached Jim or Jim approached us, he might have actually approached us. He was, pretty, he was an ex-Dunedin person and then we got our first gig at the Gladstone. So we made these forays to Christchurch and we immediately found an audience, uh, a sympathetic, cool audience in Christchurch. You know, Christchurch has got a really, well, still has, I would say, a vibrant music scene. Um, and they sort of embraced us, you know. We were accept, uh, we weren't just accepted by Christchurch, they supported us, you know. And um, that gave us the energy to go, well, we'll get to Auckland. I, my girlfriend at the time was from Auckland. She'd moved down to Dunedin to live with me, and she went up in a. She was a school teacher, and she went up in a. Jennifer Halliday's her name. She lives in New York, and uh, she went up to uh, Auckland in a summer holes. You know, uh, I mean, not school holidays, um, May, and she hustled around Auckland. Uh, met David Merritt, who was managing 
the blams and pneumatics and screaming me and he, they sort of had a collective management thing and she got us a gig with them and we also played the Auckland Battle of the Bands <laughs> and that was our first foray to Auckland and um, we were supported by the Auckland bands, the Screaming Memes were really cool to us. They gave us a support gig at um, the Reverb Room. The Memes, um, yeah, gave us a break and essentially they they had an audience and a big following at the time and they they basically, the, their audience, they just gave their audience to us and, you know, it was totally cool. So there was a very, at that time <coughs> throughout New Zealand, there was a very collective uh, you know, uh, sharing of everything. Yeah, uh, my brother absconded. He he got sick of Auckland. Um, it was a pretty weird scene. It, it, uh, Auckland had moved from the punk period into the sort of skinhead boot boy period, and it was quite. Uh, there were some cool people around, but it was quite. There was an element of violence. <coughs> um, there was also an element of what the hell are we doing or where are we going? And uh, David got a bit fed up with it. You know, we were living a pretty crazy lifestyle. I think. Most of the time I was in Auckland up until he left. We were on the dole, you know, unemployed, living in sort of pretty, uh, you know, wild sort of flats. I lived on Ponsonby Road and, you know, Ponsonby Road was all graffitied and was pretty rough. Uh, we had a, we lived with a guy who renovated cars, Michael Nucky, who was in a band called Billy and the Blue Flames and we had a car wreck outside of our place and uh, King Cobras, a Polynesian gang, chased a, uh, a punk into our, you know, flat because it was recognised as sort of a punk flat or whatever, and sort of beat him up in the kitchen, you know. And I was lying in bed one night, had a brick thrown through my window after that. So there was like tensions, you know. It was kind of weird because a lot of the skinheads or boot boys were Polynesian or of Maori or you know, or mostly actually Polynesian background. It's sort of on two sides, but di different, you know, musical leanings. <laughs> Uh, I guess we, we missed out on the AK-79 thing because we are sort of tail end. We sort of came in on Toy Love's coattails and they hosted us basically in Auckland. We were treated very well, but, um, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to know what people perceived of us, you know, how we're perceived. Because we were from Dunedin. I had longish hair at that time and that was an affront to uh, all the... Uh, Auckland punks, they would sort of tell me to get a haircut. And I'd say, why? So I look like you. <laughs> mm. Tally Ho was done during the winter in Christchurch at a studio, you know, home studio in Christchurch, um, Arnold Van Bussel had a studio. Mm. Honey, that was an experience because he had a, a, a guitar pedal that he had, you know, connected to his tape machines or whatever, and he said, oh, this is what I do with the drums. I put the drums through this pedal that gives them this unique sound, you know, which is actually a shocking sound. You know, people described it as um, sounding like uh, someone was recording drums under army blankets or something. But he put the old, you know, guitar effect on the drums, and we said, oh, it's not too bad, I suppose. So we just, you know, went with it and accepted what he did. I think we recorded Boodle in uh, August of 81. Yeah, it's a frontier hall, it's just a little, strange little wooden hall, you know, pretty pokey. Doug um, Hood had had, you know, years of experience of working as a sound man, you know, front of house, doing live mixing for Toy Love. Um, basically, he got some live sound equipment, you know, a desk and everything like that, or effects and various things and um, we just hooked up Chris's uh, four track. So we had quite good quality uh, equipment going into the four track. And it was very limiting um, that, you know, because you've got four tracks, you've got to figure out what goes where, you know, drums on one track and, but that limitation also gave, gave it a, a good, um, solid sound as well. And Doug's expertise, you know, from his work with Toy Love really helped his live work, and also the fact he'd seen the band quite a bit live too. It was early on, yeah. Um, Peter, you know, uh, created the bass line basically, so the foundation of the song. 
uh, just a spontaneous jam. And uh, the titles nicked off a um, Jefferson Airplane album. I think Grace Slick was, she was don't point that thing at me like a gun or whatever. I think I was just walking up a hill on Dunedin at night or something, and uh, the whole sort of melody and lyrical sort of concept came to me. It's basically about uh, a relationship uh, fragmenting a uh, girlfriend. I like minimalism in music, you know, the Ramones were a um, great example of that. And the Velvets too, you know, New York, New York groups, generally there's been a minimalist strain in music, things being simplified, taken back, often, often in the simplicity you find magic things and you know with beat keeping and drumming, um, you're looking for a groove predominantly, that's the that's a weird word too, it's, it's, it's feel and it's about tempo, so it's just looking for this magic sort of spot where beats sit. And uh, I've always sort of been interested in that music because a, you can hear a drummer and some drummers annoy the hell out of me. They just, when they, the way they play, it drives me crazy because I just think, you're not playing the drums, you're not feeling where the, where the beat is, you're sort of like, you're doing something else, it's sort of mechanical. And I, I don't really like that in music, even though I really like mechanic, mechanical things in drumming. Groups like Kraftwerk and German Krautrock, and it's always been a, uh, a fascination for me. Yeah. It's hard to say, it's just such an organic thing. You know, a group is um, very much uh, the components. It isn't one person, there isn't really a leader, to, to be quite honest. There's, a, there's an interaction, you know, there's a circular, unspoken sort of psychic uh, connection between people when they, if they're good, <laughs> you know, good musicians or whatever. It's just sort of, it's telepathic, you know. It goes beyond uh, boundaries or sort of ways of, you know, describing 